Welcome, everyone. I see many of you joining the virtual room. My name is Mylise Cazaron. I'm the Managing Director of the Catalyst Fund, and it's a pleasure to see many of you uh, for this session today. We have incredible speakers joining us, and it's a pleasure for me to share the stage with them. They span both entrepreneurs and investors, and I actually will let them introduce themselves in a little short while. But first things first, let us start by giving you a little bit of context on this session. So today's discussion is titled The Business Case of Investing in Climate Resilience Ventures. And you may wonder, you know, what is, why are we talking about this in Financial Inclusion Week? Which is a good question. Well, I'm glad that maybe you were pondering because that's exactly what we're seeking to answer through the discussion. And that is, you know, the role that fintech innovation and tech innovation more broadly can play in enabling the resilience of climate vulnerable communities across emerging markets. So as many of you um, obviously already know, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but between fires, droughts, floods, and many more climate induced events and disasters, there is an urgent need to build climate resilience among households and communities that are the most vulnerable to climate change. And those happen to be across emerging markets, in particularly in Africa, in spite of obviously having contributed the least to the problem in the first place. And indeed, it, it is predicted that climate change impacts are likely to send more than 130 million people into poverty. Luckily though, innovators um, are at the forefront again of meeting need in the same way that many FinTech innovators were at the forefront of trying to address issues of financial inclusion and financial health for the past two decades. And they are already creating tools and services that help people manage disasters, adapt their assets and livelihood, and also build long-term resilience. But as promising and impactful as this, these innovations are, we're hearing actually from one of them today, they do struggle with many of the challenges that all early stage ventures face, mostly funding, talent, partnerships, and, and many more. And I think there's a common theme across all of these issues, which is the difficulty of many of these solutions to actually create monetizable commercial models that are scalable with venture funds. To date, actually 6% of global funding for climate has gone to climate adaptation and resilience, which is abysmally low when the estimated amount needed to actually fill the adaptation gap is $330 billion. So why is this? What is the business case? Why are investors not actually deploying more capital into the space? And what is actually the role of FinTech to enable greater access, right, affordability and, uh, and reach of these pioneering solutions that startups are already deploying across emerging markets? So with that, we have an incredible panel that represents later stage investors with, fund, with DFIs such as British International Investment with Catherine Edmonds from the climate team. We have a um, growth stage fund with Jose Garcia from Gawa Capital. And we have early stage funds uh, with Scott Onder from Mercicore Ventures. So they're really, between the three of them represent the full continuum of investing. And we also have, are lucky to have Aisha who actually is building herself a solution for climate resilience in Africa uh, and is the CEO and founder of farms to You. So, Let's start um, with you, Aisha, if you can give us a, a very quick introduction before we jump into the discussion. Sure. Um, I'm Aisha, co-founder and CEO of Founds to You. We are um, an infrastructure company that is working in Nigeria and Kenya to bridge the gap between the informal demand side um, and the formal supply side. To put that into context, we help the traditionally unlendable um, segment of the society, which in, uh, includes uh, informal um, workers like smallholder farmers, artisans, access capital, um, because these are uh, these these represent a significant portion of um, the population on the continent and um, are also uh, faced with. Um, in access to finance, particularly affordable finance. And um, yeah, that's my brief. Um, it's something that is very important to, to me and to my community and um, hence why we're building this space. 
Thanks, Miley. Wonderful. Thanks, Aisha. And now let's go in order early to later stage. So Scott, I'll, I'll give it over to you. Thanks, Miley. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Scott Onder uh, with Mercy Corps Ventures, uh, joining you all today from, from San Francisco. Um, really excited to be part of this conversation. Um, as an early stage investor, uh, we are uh, squarely focused on investing in climate resilience technologies, as well as fintech, ag tech, and climate tech solutions that can help communities adapt and, and um, strengthen uh, their resilience in the face of the shocks and volatility related to climate change. Um, we've been building a portfolio starting at pre-seed and seed stage investments um, of over, order, over uh, 40 companies uh, currently that are really, uh, it, it's a constellation of solutions um, across the, those sectors that, that um, we see kind of addressing the climate crisis in, in frontier and emerging markets. So um, a lot of our focus is uh, supporting entrepreneurs in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia um, that are, that are um, developing high growth potential companies. And um, in addition to capital, we're looking for ways we can uh, st support them strategically through partnerships, through consulting projects and so forth. Uh, but yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. We're going to definitely ask you a lot of questions about how you select those incredible portfolio companies that you have in your portfolio. Um, Jose? Hello, everyone. So I'm Jose Garcia. I'm head of transformation and impact in Gawa Capital. So we are an asset manager based here in Madrid. And uh, so uh, I think we uh, we handle a portfolio of around 100 million uh, euros investments, uh, mainly in financial inclusion, agricultural value chains, and of course, uh, climate resilience, right? Uh, so um, we we invest in growth, uh, as, as you were mentioned, and we also play uh, give a big importance to uh, not only deliver impact through our partners, but also helping our partners to uh, improve their the impact they are reaching, eh, right, through uh, technical assistance and capacity building, which is like a, a core part of our business uh, through our uh, you know blended finance funds. Uh, uh, thanks. Excellent. A similar approach to Scott in that mix of um, support, but also capital. So capital plus approach. Interesting. And Tatwin? Hello there. I'm uh, Tatwin uh, Owen Edmonds. I'm a climate associate at uh, British International Investment uh, with the UK's development finance institution and impact investor. And uh, we look to sort of solve the biggest development challenges by investing patient flexible capital to support private sector growth and innovation. Um, and sort of in a practical sense, you know, it's a, a mix of, you know, fund of funds, uh, debt, equity, a variety of uh, sort of products, but also a technical assistance a facility and a wide, wider package of support, as Josie and Scott mentioned, to, you know, um, our intermediaries and, um, and funds as well. Um, you know, our markets are Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, the the boilerplate goal is, you know, productive, sustainable, and inclusive economies. Um, and that's what we aim to achieve. And we've got a big focus on adaptation and resilience, um, as that's seen as one of the great challenges, particularly in that sustainable pillar. Fantastic. And we've seen that BAI has recently made large commitments to invest more capital towards climate in general and specific specifically climate adaptation and resilience. So we'll definitely ask you more about that strategy later on. So let's start with Aisha actually, because I want to come back with the entrepreneurs out there that are actually solving this problem firsthand. So Aisha, you are serving farmers across several countries in Africa and farmers are some of the most vulnerable individuals to climate change. They depend on natural resources. Those uh, incomes are volatile as a result. And um, I, I'm curious to hear from you, you know, what, what climate threats are your customers already experiencing? And um, how are you meeting those needs or helping them overcome those threats? And then specifically, you know, what is the role of FinTech in all of this, like in your solution? Can you comment on that? Sure. So um, how is 
the climate already impacting these uh, users. It's impacting them significantly. I can give an example of one of our farmers, um, Mr. Ayub. Um, he's one of several farmers in Niger State, Nigeria, who has recently been impacted by the floods. Um, we had heavy rains and there was also the dam in Cameroon, which led to significant floods where there has been loss of land. As you rightly mentioned, these farmers are already working on very thin margins, which is representative of most informal workers anyway. Um, so any slight um, glitch in the system in terms of the margins, uh, the cost goes slightly high. That really puts their income, which is already quite slim, at risk. Um, so it's it's a real problem, and this is not even touching on the fact that the rains are much uh, are much later, um, which means that, and um, given that in Nigeria and Kenya is where our core operations are currently. These farmers are mainly rain fed, are practicing rain fed agriculture, i.e. they're not using um, greenhouse farming um, significantly, they're depending on the weather. And the weather is becoming increasingly um, unpredictable. So, you know, there are so many, the, the, the climate impacts are coming from several angles. Um, now, how does this play to finance? Farmers need finance to start their production or to scale their production. Um, and uh, if they don't have access to affordable finance, it means their income is at risk. And more importantly, food security is at risk because uh, smallholder farmers actually represent 70% of the production capacity on the continent of Africa. So there's so many angles that come into play here. Now, how do we how is FarmC looking to build around this problem? Um, we actually have created a product that is hinged on um, affordable finance. Through our platform, farmers have access to finance um, in the form of loans. Now, the key thing that we're providing for the lenders here is that we are assessing the farmer's risk level in a way that is more appropriate for the farmers. Traditionally, uh, lenders look at things like uh, what is your monthly salary? I want to see your pay slip to assess a borrower's risk. These are not um, applicable. These data points are not applicable wow. to farmers. Things like if the farmer is insured, if the farmer has a guaranteed offtaker upon the uh, product harvest, or comparing the farmer's yields to the market yields, these are more um, pertinent ways of assessing the risk level of a farmer. And this is how we then build value. I think we've lost your sound, Aisha. I wasn't sure if it was just me. Well, while we get Aisha back, um, this is a this is a model that Can is really exciting. Yes, yeah, you're back. Loud and clear. <laughs> um, technology. Uh, so this is just showing the the uh, increasing volatility that we have in our uh, uh, ecosystem. And for farmers, this is how we use our infrastructure using the loan product to ensure that our farmers are insured. Going back to Mr. Yuba, who I mentioned at the start of this conversation that has been faced with floods, in the past, he would have lost his income and would be unable to pay back his loan. But because of how we designed our product, um, he has insurance. So we're already in the process with the insurance to actually recover um, his income and his output, which also protects uh, the lender as well. So essentially, it's very important because of how increasingly volatile the market is becoming to first of all, ensure that farmers have the sufficient capital that they need to um, fund production. And then once they do have access to that capital, ensuring that they're utilizing it in the right way, because a lot of repayment is not just from farmers not wanting to repay, it's because their yield is a lot much lower than expected. Insurance can cover things like that. It, it sometimes is because the seeds that they use were of poor quality, ensuring that they buy from they buy seeds from quality assured uh, vendors can mitigate against that. So how do we help these vulnerable uh, members of communities um, be, be better safeguarded against the climate impact, which is right here and now. Um, we haven't already, we haven't seen the impact of Russia and Ukraine um, on uh, the next harvest cycle. And now we've obviously had the floods in Pakistan, which is quite unfortunate. And um, Nigeria as well, lots of farms have been impacted. So food prices are going to go up. 
and this already vulnerable members of communities are going to be affected even more. I don't want to hone on the problem too much because a lot of folks are aware of it, but if you're not on the ground, like we are at Farms to You, it's, it's quite heart wrenching because again, going back to Mr. Yuba, Yuba's farm, his rain levels were this high. So it's quite unlikely that he's going to be able to harvest any rice um, once it comes to harvest period. So right, right. hopefully that answers your you. Absolutely. And farm to you plays a critical role on um, protecting obviously farmers from the shock via, of, of course, your embedded finance products, but not only, right? Because you are actually trying to at least convince or, you know, change behavior so that farmers actually transition to regenerative agriculture practices. So can you tell us a bit more about that and how you're seeing the increased climate resilience on the ground? Climate resilience has to be tied with profitability. It's very difficult to go to a farmer who already has very low margins to say, do this practice that is better for the environment um, so that you can essentially help the environment be better. Quite frankly, that farmer doesn't care because all that farmer cares about is how do I feed myself? How do I feed my family? I'm already, uh, I already have a very um, strained income. Um, we have the privilege, I say we by um, folks on this call, you have the privilege to, um, for instance, say that maybe I'll cycle to work as opposed to taking, um, driving my car. Uh, but these are folks that have very few choices um, to make. So I think there's a real need to tie the resilience practices with finance, which is why farmers have to have access to affordable capital, because if they don't have access to affordable capital, they can't um, scale regenerative farming practices. And uh, sustainable farmers make a significant uh, percentage of farmers on the continent that it's really important to ensure that these farmers um, are protected in terms of um, scaling sustainable practices because we have seen there's some times that farmers might try to make uh, shortcuts by using excessive chemicals or essentially um, other unsustainable practices because they think that's better for the um, for their profit line but in the long term yeah. it isn't but if they that's have access to that finance it would help mitigate against that yeah very very important point you're making and it has to go hand in hand. And so staying with this, with this uh, concept, I want to actually turn to the investors in the room. So, of course, thinking about enabling climate resilience, but you all are also looking for returns. Um, and you've already invested in a lot of climate innovation to date that specifically look at adaptation and resilience as a goal. So what's the business case that you see? What, how do you articulate it? Um, and and what how, is especially internally, like how, how have you structured the business case for investing more in climate resilient solutions at your fund? And I'd love to start with Scott. Great, yeah, thanks for the question, Mylise. And um, you know, I think, as you mentioned earlier, um, the aspect that, that climate change could uh, push an additional 132 million people into poverty um, is, you know, substantial it's just such a massive challenge to even get your your mind around and, and to think on top of this that low-income countries bear you know up to 75 80 percent of the costs of climate change um whenever there's a there's a challenge space like this there, there's also from my perspective a, a design opportunity um that entrepreneurs brilliant entrepreneurs step up to address and it's in this you know innovation laboratory that that we see um the potential for, for some of the uh, you know, scalable businesses of the next decade. And in climate resilience, uh, there's no exception to that. I, I think this is a new set of, of challenges and problems that, that entrepreneurs uh, have the opportunity to, to solve, and, and, and they're stepping up to do so with disrupt, disruptive technologies, with, with financial innovations, uh, with innovative business models and distribution approaches. And so, our investment thesis really uh, looks across um, how climate change is affecting food systems, how it's affecting supply chains, how it's uh, affecting people's ability to participate in the, the global economy. And on all those levels, entrepreneurs are already developing uh, fascinating solutions. So, um, you know, from I think artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and how that's opening up uh, the opportunity for, for businesses to 
you know, do things like unlock hyperlocal tropical weather forecasts. We have a portfolio company called Ignitia that's doing that and delivering those tropical forecasts uh, to anybody's uh, phone, including farmers. And uh, we we're seeing those same kind of data sets being uh, tapped into uh, for advanced flood data analytics. Uh, we have a company called Cl Cloud to Street in our portfolio that's providing those those uh, flood data analytics to insurance companies, to municipalities, governments, and so forth to help them adapt and, and, and be climate smart. Um, we're seeing a, a, a surge in the last few years of, of Web3 startups and protocols that are tokenizing carbon credits. They're improving the measurement and verification related to those, those carbon uh, credits to make sure that uh, carbon is truly being pulled out of the atmosphere and sequestered, that you know, it's providing this, this new design space around how we can protect natural resources and, and do so in an economical way. So yeah, we are seeing just brilliant entrepreneurs stepping up and turning their attention to confronting the, the climate crisis. And um, our, our focus has always been at that earliest stage, that kind of pre-seed and seed stage when, when companies are still uh, trying to figure out whether their, their product is truly solving real challenges that, that people face and they're, they're iterating on it. They're um, working closely with customers to incorporate their, their voices and, and needs into the, the design and delivery of those products. And as they grow and kind of get to that product market fit um, to bring in other investors that can help, you know, scale up those companies is something that we've been uh, squarely focused on. Um, yeah. And we're actually a few years in, uh, in the climate resilience investment space, really starting to see a lot more momentum and uh, it's pretty encouraging. Fascinating, especially the examples that you mentioned, leveraging very deep technology actually to tackle some of these challenges and the companies you mentioned. I'm curious, how many investments has Mercercourt made in the space already? And how many more are in your pipeline? Yeah, well, uh, we, we've certainly, I think, made um, over 25 investments that are um, directly in like the, the investment thesis around climate wow. adaptation mm -hmm. resilience. Um, we also think about climate resilience a, a bit more holistically um, and, and see opportunities okay. with fintech um, and ag agritech also being uh, quite uh, compelling in terms of helping communities be more resilient. So mm -hmm. it may not directly be a climate tech solution per se, but we, we think it's a resilient solution that, that can help communities um, uh, weather challenges, the volatility to re related to the shocks and stress of, of climate induced disasters or, or so forth. Um, and, and therefore, I, you know, I stepping back and I think we could kind of get into a conversation around this um, climate smart solutions, I, I think can span a range of sectors and, and solutions and um, we're really seeing entrepreneurs redefine uh, what resilience means. I agree completely. And I actually concur that when you think about resilience, you have to have an holistic lens because there's a lot of things that will be disrupted and where adaptation is needed. So jumping to you, um, Tatwin, I know you spend a lot of time at BII actually thinking about how to define this, the opportunity space. So how would how do you, how does BI articulate this, and um, what is the investment opportunity from your perspective, especially as a DFI? So you have mul multiple levels where you can be an actor, enabling more capital to flow in climate resilience. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of the sort of you know business opportunity and the market opportunity, as sort of already mentioned by 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 Scott, you know view it in kind of through two lenses one is the urgent climate need you know particularly in our markets and africa and south asia where you know it is you know it's a real reality on the on, on the ground uh and then you know interesting we're seeing it in real life i mean so for the last two years we've um you know, been running an emerging economies climate report where we reach out to our investees both intermediaries and and com and the companies themselves and you know um, this year, for example, we got the results in today, actually, you know, 68% of respondents say that climate change is affecting their business today. You know, more than half say that climate change will affect the viability of their business in the next five years, you know, and 72% will are uh, concerned it will affect the growth of their business. So there's that sort of, you know, this is a scale of the problem, you know, business case, I suppose, the, the, the sort of the 
the risk um but also as scott said you know the opportunity and where you know where where there's risk there's you know there's opportunity for innovation i think and this is sort of touching a little bit on what i used to said are a big challenge because you know bi has made a commitment to invest three billion in climate over the next five years and 200 million of which in a special climate innovation facility which is uh, you know highly concession concessional blended capital to address exactly these sorts of solutions um web bi and double others of development impact investors you know face challenges how to unlock that capital and specifically how to measure that the impact how to ensure that those dollars are having the effect on the ground that um you know that you intend them to have at the moment we're following the mdb methodology uh which is sort of a three-step process to uh sort of analyze whether something is climate finance or not so you i did basically identify is it is there a physical climate risk occurring second is um is the solution addressing that risk and then thirdly, and with that second one, also if there's a do no harm, you know, is there a maladaptation being caused? And thirdly, and importantly, you know, how do you measure it? Now, the MDB methodology is 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 sort of fairly new, and definitely, you know, a challenge that we're looking at is how to, you know, move or repurpose that three step process. Um, in a way that's applicable for for venture and and startups because in the adaptation space a lot of these solutions are are new um you know and also and also very early at which point an mdb methodology created by big multi-level development banks you know where they've got big teams a load of bankers and <laughs> and approach it that way isn't going to work if you're putting it in the on the doorsteps of an entrepreneur, you know, struggling day to day on the ground. However, you know, however, that's sort of what needs to be done and the challenge we're facing in terms of actually unlocking the capital um, so that it's almost, it's, it's evidenced that it's going to the right place. Um, mm -hmm. And that's possibly a very simplistic way of putting it, but I think that that sort of, the big challenge we're looking at and what we're looking to it to address right right so we need to look for practical ways to actually build that evidence of the work happening on the ground that players like aisha and her team at from to you are pioneering agree um and jose um, from from gawa's perspective i mean you you actually have been in this space for long for a long time because you invested in financial inclusion and agri-tech and now obviously also with the climate resilience lens so what models are you seeing that are giving you this evidence that I'm speaking about, like impact on the ground, um, as well as, of course, financial returns for investors like yourself that play a bit at the growth stage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you as you were mentioning, uh, Gawa has been, was uh, active into the financial inclusion and agricultural value change uh, space for long. And then resilience came to us, let, let's say, naturally, right? So our most of our end beneficiaries uh, are being affected by climate change every every day uh, more. And then and the same our partners, right? So uh, the request for funding or to ways uh, to to investigate ways of dealing with this new risk, it's been uh, going on for several years, right? So we kind of uh, get, got into this uh, climate lens uh, through our uh, investees and final beneficiary requests. So then, uh, of course, we can talk about like the business models. Right? If you look at the cost and benefits uh, uh, of most of these practices where we are, looking, we are um, most of our investments are related to agricultural and shifting agricultural practices to uh, make uh, smaller farmers more resilient, right? So if you look at those type of cost benefits, they, they they look pretty good on on the long term right but there's huge issues as uh, that wing was uh, uh, mentioning on how those benefit benefits actually are measured and how long does it take to realize in practice right so uh, um, so investors uh, have, like our, our our investors in, in gawa they need to see more uh, more data 
a more like practical practical evidence on 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 those issues, right? So I think that's a little bit what is holding on uh, uh, the tsunami to flood uh, this type of uh, new ventures, right? Because if you we all are saying that of course the, the business case looks good, so why the finance is not there, right? If it looks so good, so what is what is uh, what are the breaks uh, the breaks to it, right? Because everyone everybody is saying that uh, okay, this is uh, pretty clear to everybody. Uh, but yeah, I think there's big issues on how to uh, realize those benefits. How long term are they? Uh, because some of them, they, of course, will only materialize in the future. And how reliable, how reliable is the data we have to assess uh, the actual uh, benefits that we are saying that we provide, right? So I think that there, there's uh, big issues around data that need to be solved together with all the ecosystem, right? Because not only mm -hmm. DAWA or DFIs or uh, the entrepreneurs are gonna be able to handle that level of uh, methodology to provide uh, proof uh, that this is uh, a, pro a proper benefit, right? So I think that's the big issue. We see we see a clear, a clear business case. There's a clear demand from uh, uh, partners, uh, final beneficiaries, and also investors, which are really aware of the problem. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, methodology and data missing in the middle, I think, and uh, we still have to work a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you're hitting a very important topic that I'd love for this panel to discuss, because if it's, it, there is a data issue, and yet, you know, if we wait for the data to come by in a certain, you know, organized way or certain framework, then are we just wasting precious time? Because this is obviously an urgent crisis and no time to waste. So how do we actually move faster, experiment, trial and test these solutions? How can we basically make sure that it's not 6%, it's 50% of the global funding that goes to resilience and adaptation? So questions to ask to, to all of you investors, uh, whoever wants to, to jump in first. I mean, what do you see as, ways in which we can collectively as an ecosystem increase the flows is particularly private finance or financing from the private sector into climate resilience. And what, what are the points where maybe we have to make compromises? So as you were saying, Patrick, maybe that the framework has to be adjusted and you know, so how do we get there? What's your take? I I have some contribution, um, yeah. But I, I I will like to touch on some things just that each speaker said. Um, so first of all, I I really appreciate Scott's comment on commercializing uh, carbon sequestration, for instance, because um, that goes to the point, the question you asked earlier, my lease, which is how do you get smallholder farmers to practice regenerative farming at scale? Um, it's about connecting that sustainability practice to financial um, um, impact. Um, on the question of data um, um, raised by Jose Kersey on the back of your point, financial data historically, um, when um, building businesses, it's typically been for sh shareholder interest. Um, the, 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 the business exists to increase shareholder wealth. Uh, as an economic student, that's what I was taught at school and at LENS, that is essentially the model that we've been used to for, for many years. So we don't have frameworks in place that really looking at the economic impact, social impact, these are more recent things. They're not things that we've had for a long period. For, for a long period, we looked at financial wealth only, irrespective of the social um, costs, the environmental costs. So I think, first of all, we need to understand that that gap in learning, there is a cost to it and associated cost mm. to that. Um, because in, t in, 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 t in terms of looking at the climate uh, sector, there isn't an ecosystem structure that can really support um, climate resilient businesses, um, which is why uh, for us as, as, as a business, it's really important for us to work with investors that provide venture building support. The capital is not enough. It's, it's really about those ecosystem synergies that help scale businesses. So I think, I, I think it's about shifting the mindset to, not, to understand, first of all, that for, for many centuries, we've Build, been building businesses purely for financial wealth creation um, and, and, and you know, neglecting the costs from environmental social uh, components. And that there has to be a cost associated with that. 
um, we do not have the luxury of time to wait for um, an Adam, uh, father of economics, to come up with a law of demand and supply as to how do we manage climate. We do not have the time for that. It's really about how do you experiment quickly, and this is where it's important for you know the more established institutions to be able to work with smaller enterprises, uh, startups like ours. There are a lot of other very interesting businesses that are working in the climate resilient space and really being um, flexible in terms of trying to experiment things and try things out. So mm -hmm. I think that would be my take on that. Very well said, Aisha. So investors in the room, I mean, from, from your perspective, how do we increase the funding flow from a BFI, you know, growth stage investor, early stage investor, like what do you see as uh, opportun opportunities we're not capturing yet? Well, if, if I could jump in uh, to, to start that conversation around, you know, venture led approaches. So uh, as Aisha and, and so many brilliant entrepreneurs are doing, they're, they're forging ahead in, in, in developing a, a more resilient future. And we need more successful models that prove that it's possible to make commercially viable businesses at scale that address climate shocks and stresses and help people adapt. Um, I'm a big proponent of having those early venture models be the catalyst to truly pull in more capital and to pull in um, evidence around measurement and, and, and solve a lot of what we're talking about. Um, 10 years ago, we had a, a hypothesis that uh, mobile money and, and fintech could expand access to financial services and emerging markets. And it, it took an entire decade, but um, it catalyzed so much more capital flows into markets in Africa, into entrepreneurial ecosystems in emerging and frontier markets. Um, I believe that the same is, is happening in the climate space right now, but we're at the kind of nascent early stages of it. Um, when we see entrepreneurs um, like Aisha developing the, these models and um, we're able to show that they're able to absorb more capital as they grow, um, that's going to really create opportunities for, for larger flows of capital to come in. And um, I, it, the global community really can step up right now by supporting those innovation ecosystems. And certainly early stage venture capital is uh, an important component of it, but but so are a lot of the support services to entrepreneurs that groups like Catalyst Fund provide. Um, so are just the, the networking, the community building around the, those innovations so everybody's learning together. And then measurement, um, to Tatwin's point, is, is so essential. How, how are we thinking about, about what the evidence truly is that this is, you know, supporting climate adaptation and resilience. And um, again, a bottom-up solution is possible there. I think if you uh, entrepreneurs are, are better than anyone at uh, utilizing data uh, and evidence so that they can fine-tune how their products and services are solving problems for, for real people. And um, they're so incentivized to, to measure that as acutely as possible so that they can build those feedback mechanisms into their product development and delivery and distribution. Um, and, and so, while you might need to start more on a case-by-case -case basis with, with measurement, over time that informs the, the larger frameworks that, that we all can use as we're evaluating the, these solutions. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would say, let's take a venture-led approach to both catalyzing more capital as well as better evidence and, and measurement to the space. Very practical response. Jose, Tatwin, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, sort of very, very, very much 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 agree with both i think the the building up a, a bank of case studies is 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 really really key um i think there's sort of three thing three things about that um one it is going to require a lot of collaboration um and that's really trying to knit together you know that that fragmented ecosystem that Aisha was talking about um you know uh, and on, on our part we so part of the adaptation resilience investors collaborative as well as the cfire alliance so which i you know i know many of our honest call and you know a lot of um you know investors at all levels and uh, and ventures are sort of working together having those conversations and having conversations much like this which is which is very very important um you know to build to sort of you know 
address together these challenges of, of metrics, you know, how to get good case studies, um, you know, what level of sort of risk to be using. Um, I think we've got to use from BII's perspective, you know, our full toolkit of, you know, what we can offer financially, as well as what we can offer in terms of, you know, supporting businesses, you know, and this is very, very key for, for, for venture, you know, offering the right level of support, you know, um, again, on the metrics, metrics point, but also helping prove, uh, prove business, business models, um, giving really, you know, concessional capital as well. Um, and that is, you know, part of our new toolkit is that, you know, um, I think it's, Definitely, um, from the DII world, um, the world of technical assistance and and uh, concession capital is is relatively new, uh, and so it's something that you know, frankly, you know, we are learning um, as we go. Um, I think there's a you know great um, uh, it's great there's there and there's a great desire to do it, but I think you know all of us, you know, probably as bottom line, need to be slightly more risk tolerant. Um, as you just said at the very beginning, you know. By the sounds of it, that the keystone of, of farm farms to you was realizing that the risk tolerance, the way that you know how risky a lender a farmer was, was just totally misjudged. And I think all of us need to make a big shift in mindset of okay, you know what that bench, what level of risk we should we should, we need to get comfortable with, um, and we know, uh, and whether we need case studies or metrics to do that, I think we just need to be, embrace it as we just might have to live in a slightly more you know risk tolerant environment when it comes to comes to addressing this problem. I couldn't agree more. Big proponents of taking risks and also being innovative with blending different forms of capital. So very glad to hear that BII is on a journey in that direction. And um, Jose, last question to you on this topic. You earlier mentioned the point of this being an issue across the entire value chains and needing to look across the spectrum right, of, of investors. So what is your wish list for your own investors, your LPs looking to invest in funds like this? What has to change at that state, at that level from your perspective? This is your chance for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope they're listening, right? Uh, so yeah, I think as, as Ted Wing was uh, mentioning, there's a huge, um, we, we have to acknowledge that risks risk need, need to be taken, right? So, and, and the level of risk into this new, uh, uh, climate tech solutions it higher than than in other industries right and 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 the end goal deserve it yeah? so that's a, that's an important thing that we, we should transmit to our all our investors then in order to kind of a push that um, uh, feeling uh, i think there's uh, tools we can use to uh, convince investors and to, to to let them feel more comfortable with that with that more risky uh, new world right and there, I think that, that as uh, that Wayne was mentioning, in the public sector, the capacity building, the blended finance, all of that new space that is kind of a, a also quite uh, originating now, uh, needs to be uh, uh, playing into these new new ideas, right? So we cannot only expect that business cases are going to arise by themselves, like naturally. I think that that's going to happen, and and it's great. But we have to make them appear uh, faster and, um, and more often, right? Because we are a bit late into the game. So, um, and, and that's the role of, uh, of uh, public sector to help uh, private investors realize how much their capital is needed uh, there, right? Because there's not enough uh, capital only from the public sector to do this. Uh, everybody has to chip in because actually uh, most of uh, of climate change has been generated by that capital in the past uh, or, or many of that capital uh, so i think there's there's uh, a lot of uh, loving and, and and awareness raising to be made and uh, it's great to have tools uh, to make that easier for us right i think that's a little bit how how, how my wish list is wonderful um, and you're right it's very much a race actually, because the, the time is, the clock is ticking. And, and speaking of races, we actually are on a race towards COP27, which is only a few weeks away now, where I know many of you in this panel are actually going to be in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, uh, taking part uh, in the conversations happening there. So before opening up for questions, because we only have 15 minutes left, 
I'd like to ask you all to respond very briefly um, and tell me what is your message to policymakers and others uh, as we gather for COP27 after several COPs, but this year it's taking place in Africa, a major focus is climate resilience. Um, so what will be your message so that we can make action a reality at this COP? I shall start with you. Um, uh, I'm pretty vocal about this because the backlash of uh, COP2026 20, um, was dis disappointing in terms of commitments being made and not being followed through within the week of uh, COP26 completed. So my, my ask from COP27 really is for um, commitments to be followed through, no matter how small or big, um, but making those commitments and actually following them through. Uh, it could be a commitment to uh, provide more capital. It may be, may be a, a commitment to provide um, support in terms of venture uh, building or even at consumer level saying that you're no longer using plastic bags but rather you'll take your tote bags to the to the shopping mall instead so I think it's about making realistic and um, achievable um, targets that will be followed through and I think there needs to be some accountability uh, I think the word greenwashing if we probably search how many times it's been uh, cropped up uh, it's it's an increasingly more popular word in the sense where folks are making commitments even um, some uh, retailers have recently been fined by certain governments for um, in, inappropriately marketing uh, their products as being sustainable I think we can't do that with sustainability. We can see the weather, it's, it's getting worse. We can see the floods, we can see the food prices. It, the, the, the writing is on the wall. So I think CSR can't be PR, we can't use sustainability, we can't use these challenges that we can see right in front of us as a marketing tactic. So yeah, make simple um, uh, and clear targets that will be followed through would be my, my wish. Thank you, Aisha. Cop? Right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to COP27 this year because I, I think we can turn a corner and, and see uh, commitments come, come to fruition um, as the world gets more serious uh, about um, addressing these challenges. And, and, and the key message that I, I'm really going to bring to uh, Sharm El Sheikh is going to be around uh, the conversation that we're having today challenging contexts drive innovation. Entrepreneurs across emerging and developed economies who are, you know, many of whom are at the front lines of, of climate change are creating technologies, tools, and solutions um, that not only uh, hold uh, uh, opportunities to address the climate crisis, but are also real commercial opportunities for, for those willing to invest and, and scale those solutions. And um, I think it's going to take a, a generation uh, defining level of uh, creativity, uh, to Tatwin's point of collaboration, of, of commitment, not just from governments, but uh, especially from the private sector. Um, but the key message there is that, you know, financing climate adaptation and resilience isn't just the right thing to do, it, it's the next big market opportunity. Beautifully said. Jose? Yeah, so following a little bit on my sports uh, metaphor of before i think we are late uh, to the game right and we are a little bit losing because uh, of being late so you don't play the game the same way uh, as you this normal right so um, i think it's important to acknowledge that we are already late uh, so uh, climate change is going to happen to some degree um, and if we don't want to lose the game we have to play different uh, so we have to keep pushing on mitigation, but a lot of more attention has to be played to resilience uh, because uh, it is needed, right? So we still want to want to win the game. It doesn't mean that we forget about mitigation if we strip a little bit to resilience and to adaptation. Uh, so I think that's an important realization, right? Uh, not um, kind of fall into wishful thinking that uh, we are going to be able to solve it very quickly and without suffering any any impacts, right? So uh, we are late, we are losing, we still want to win. Uh, so that's my message, uh, but so we have to play different. 
change the game for the, to achieve victory. Stefan? Um, yeah, I think yeah, just really simply, as I said before, just got to meet, the, make the pledges and meet them. <laughs> um, I think particularly uh, that 100 billion uh, commitment that sort of climate finance is meant to go in that um, is 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 often missed. We just just need to we just need to start hitting those numbers. And that I think is a great way to end the panel and open it up for questions. We actually have quite a few and we have 10 minutes. So I'm going to pick some, um, maybe organizing them by theme. So we have a few around the issue of data and evidence. The question from Mayada, how are investors supporting the evidence and building the data protocols and standards that are needed to support responsible development of this space? And again, if investors are not able to create it, then who, who should be responsible? wants to answer this question? I guess everyone is responsible, right? It's not only investors or the government or uh, entrepreneurs to prove their solutions or uh, civil society, right? So we're gonna, gonna push the responsibility to, to a, a single uh, stakeholder. It's a little bit uh, everyone. And also we need to coordinate, right? Uh, we cannot, uh, as many times happen, uh, receive, receive regulation from uh, the public sector that is not really aligned with the public, uh, with the private uh, methodologies that are already taking or, or trying to be in place. That is also not realistic to some of the uh, entrepreneurs or models that are being developed, right? It's not actually really helping them sometimes. So there's a, a lot of noise that sometimes is, uh, I don't know, but by trying to solve the problem, everyone by themselves, we are actually not solving it and causing trouble or generating noise. So I think uh, we need to like work together a lot more, which is not easy. Agreed. And uh, on the point of how efforts that are already ongoing to build these data standards or protocols, Tatooine, would you like to comment on that? Oh, can you repeat that, sorry? Oh, sorry. I was saying on the on the former question, which was, what are ongoing efforts to build the data centers and protocols? Because so you mentioned BII is part of a collaborative that is looking at this and you're developing a methodology. So, what um, what are investors already doing, right, to support the responsible development of this space? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, specifically for the adaptation and resilience investors collaborative, we've got you know 18 members across you know DFIs and then uh, sort of um, uh you know other organizations sort of you know looking at this uh we've you know one of our, our key working groups and that is is on metrics um and we're looking to sort of one line on a common approach of what impact metrics um should look like um for adaptation resilience um and then you know that will be uh i think sort of well, powerful you know for, for two reasons one you have sort of 18 organizations aligned on what input those sort of impact metrics you know, sh should should look like uh, and then they can actually start you know testing those impact metrics on the you know, very large you know um, volume of investments that combined you know that, that they have um, and sort of proofing them uh, and you know pining to them and you know putting putting the feet to the fire basically for that um, so that's sort of what practically you know uh, we're doing on that you know other organizations and you know i think it's always and who are looking at looking at this um i know that c alliance uh, are taking a look at it too uh, but uh there's an organization called climate collective out in india who are um sort of you know, recently put together a um a sort of guidebook of um of the various different um taxonomies and methodologies out there specifically looking for vet, uh, adventure um and i think you know for for adaptation in particular that's going to be very very important uh, and so you know the, the right sizing of, of of all of these um uh, and work you know for example that climate collective are doing to to make sure it's really tailored um you know and usable um is is yeah is important and exciting so that's sort of what's going on at the, the moment i suppose it's you know at the point of it being developed and just about to be piloted, I suppose, is, is probably a way of looking at it. Yeah, that's true. It's early days and 
just jumping on what Tadwin just said, the CIFAR Alliance, which is a collaborative of organizations looking at the intersection of digital finance and climate resilience, has one working group focused on metrics and measurement. And uh, one of the key things we're looking at is how to make the measurement frameworks really usable, practical for early stage founders, and also not reinvent the wheel. And so bringing you know, all the voices at one table as to your point, Jose, I think it's really important not to just build different frameworks in your style, but you know, at least have one shared understanding of, of how we can build the space responsibly. Thank you both. Um, I'm gonna to jump to another question from the audience that is uh, coming from Michael. So he says he's coming from JPAL, an, an organization that works to reduce poverty with scientific evidence. And he's curious if you have thoughts to share on specific examples when investors were not willing to actually invest in a company or finance a specific project because you were not convinced of the efficacy or the benefits of that project on the ground because of lack of data. And I guess, you know, the same question could, could go to you, Aisha, like as any of the investors you've spoken with said no, because they were not convinced because of you know lack of data at the, at the stage that you're at but of course it's, it's early days so both perspectives happy to go first um i think um yeah certainly from our perspective and uh it, you know uh, jose uh covered in his answer in terms of collaborative um relationships and building uh structured structure of how to display data because there's no standard to say this is how um, the impact is being implemented um, it, it's essentially driven by the entrepreneur of course things like the um, SDGs uh, the climate SDGs and the um, AU which is the African Union 2067 targets as well those type of structures we're able to talk around them um, I, I suppose it's 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 hard to then breaking it down to a very low level is very much subjective. Um, so some of the feedback that we have received in the past, we've not received outright no's because there's no data available because there is some level of data. But I think it's the translation or the interpretation of the data that we have had issues with in the sense where um, we say we share this piece of data with someone um, and it's translated in a different way to another person. Um, so there isn't like a, a, a common way of viewing the data from that sense. Um, I think that's the experience I've had that's me from interacting with investors. Interesting. Any of the investors have said no? Because you're not convinced? None have outrightly said no. I'm not convinced because of the lack of data. But then again, um, it, it it couldn't have played a part, but uh, certainly haven't had like that being an explicit reason as to why an investor has said no. Mm -hmm. That said, um, you know, again, and this comes from working with very collaborative and cooperative investors, which is uh, very required to scale a business like ours. We have received feedback that, oh, you guys should be tracking um, the yields, the impact on your yield more accurately. Um, you should mm -hmm. be tracking the income more accurately. So we've actually developed a, a very um, detailed measuring um, uh, dashboard that starts to measure like the impact it. of, yeah. So, so that's something that we've actually designed based on the feedback we got from investors. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen that that has actually helped a lot because uh, it also helps our decision making. I think Scott made a comment about that in the sense of, you know, you go through an experiment, you had your hypothesis, and then you had the outcome. And you can start saying that the reason why um, A plus B is equal to C is as a result of this, and you can make a better decision in the next cycle. Um, and that's essentially where the, the, the impact of data and then machine learning starts to come into play. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's been our experience. I would, I would ju jump in to add to that. Th those are such key insights that um, with early stage investing, it's it's so essential to to collaborate with uh, companies to co-design better measurement systems. And one thing that we're looking for are, are entrepreneurs that truly have that 
goal around impact embedded into their their companies and to their objectives and that willingness to work together over time to design better and better measurement systems as their business evolves. And so we think about it as an impact management approach, not just just measurement uh, at one moment in time, but but over the course of the evolution of that company, it needs to mature and evolve as well. And, and really, I think the best entrepreneurs know that if, and this may sound trite, but the, the more resilient they can help their users and customers become, the more resilient their business models can be. And, and so for, from our standpoint, incentives are really aligned uh, for entrepreneurs to, to measure better, more precisely, um, and more accurately so that they can better serve their customers, which in turn creates better businesses. And with that, uh, unfortunately, we need to end this conversation because we're at the end of the hour. I think we could continue to talk for many more hours and answer many more specific questions about what metrics. Hopefully this has opened the appetite to continue the conversation online in another forum. So thank you to these wonderful panelists and thank you to everyone in the audience and hope you have a great rest of Financial Inclusion Week.